to some of you, you thought this day would never arrive. Amen, Amen. yes. <laughs> to others of you, perhaps a few, maybe a sad occasion of sorts because you love the book of Galatians. It is the gospel of grace, the book of Galatians, the letter of grace. And I've thought about what we are going to engage in or what we're going to teach and study next and I want to let you know that uh, next week, the next couple of weeks, we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 5, discussing humility, as the text talks about it there. And then we will begin a series that I intended to begin about two or three years ago. I intended to go through Isaiah 53, Isaiah 52, 10 through Isaiah 53, about two or three years ago. That didn't work out, and so we went through a whole series on the church. Remember that? Ephesians 2, 11 and following. Well, I have been prompted, I, I hope by the Spirit of God, to go back to Isaiah, but even more than just Isaiah, to start in the book of Genesis and work our way through the Old Testament text to look at prophecies regarding the Messiah. So Genesis three fifteen. Genesis 49, other passages that reveal a coming Messiah and will note his characteristics and what prompted the, the statement by God concerning this Messiah. What does he say about the Messiah? And we'll work, all our, we'll work our way to Isaiah 53 and spend some time as well in Isaiah 53. And the thought is that maybe around Next April, Resurrection Day, Easter, we'll be in Isaiah 53 and it will perhaps culminate at that time. So it will be quite a while in that section. I'm reading some books. I'm enjoying the study immensely, immensely right now. And so I, I think it will be a great encouragement for us to see how Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road, when Jesus says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, told them how the Scriptures spoke of him. Well, let's go back and let's see what the Scriptures say about him. So I'm, I'm, I think you'll be encouraged. I think you'll be uh, amazed at God's, the consistency and the order of God's revelation of himself. And it will help us to understand how when Christ did come on the scene... Why Israel reacted the way they did. They should have embraced their Messiah. They knew he was coming. And they did not. Because they were off track in many ways. And we'll see all these things. But first, there are final words to consider here in Galatians chapter 6. In verses 16 through 18. Our final words to someone are important. Especially to those people whom we love dearly. These words are very important. The second to the last time that Jonathan and David were able to talk freely to one another, Jonathan said this to David, Go in safety inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Those were the Next to the last words that Jonathan spoke to David. You see how important these words are. Go in safety. And we are standing on this promise that we have made forever. The Lord will stand and will witness between me and you. Between your descendants and my descendants. And a little later, perhaps a year later, Jonathan said this. He arose and he went to David at Horesh, and these are his last words to David. Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you, and Saul, my father, knows that also. Those were very important words. They were prophetic in a sense. Jonathan knew God's call on David. Jonathan knew that God had taken his divine enablement away from Saul. Of course, what Jonathan did not know is that he would be killed in the battle with the Philistines along with his brother and his father. But those were important words, and I'm sure David never forgot them. And he grieved over the death of Jonathan. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 7 and verse 8, there are Jesus' last words to his disciples. Those 11 and 12 that he spent so much time with them. He said in verse 7, 
It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part or the uttermost parts of the earth. These are our Lord's last words to his 11 disciples whom he had spent the previous three years with. Witnesses are people. A witness is a person who sees something and he tells others about it. A witness for our Lord is simply someone who tells the truth about him. The English word martyr comes from this word witness. Stephen was a witness of our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 22 in verse 20 as he was being stoned the statement from the writer here in chapter 22 and verse 20 it says and when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed I also Paul was saying this I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him your martyr Stephen a martyr is a or a witness is a designation of those who have suffered death in consequence of confessing Jesus Christ. Some people have, the, have a surname, Justin Martyr. Justin who was martyred. It was, martyr was his, not his last name. And most of the apostles and many disciples sealed their witness to Christ with their blood becoming martyrs. Their blood, says the second century theologian Tertullian, is the seed of the church. As their blood was spilt, the church was being strengthened and it was spreading. Being a witness for Christ throughout the centuries has resulted in many suffering and being killed. And our Lord's final words to the disciples were powerful, they were motivating, and they would lead many to suffering. And so we have in this epistle to the Galatians, Paul's last words to them. And they are important. In Galatians chapter 6, important words. And this long conclusion that he spends with them, remember, this long conclusion began in verse 11. And that verse 11 marks the return once again to the antithesis of cross and circumcision. That is the religion of human achievement versus the, of divine achievement. This is man's way. This is God's way. This is man's wisdom. This is God's wisdom. And Paul is highlighting and summarizing his main point in this closing comments in verses 11 and following. His main point is seen in verse 6 of chapter 1 all the way through chapter 4 and verse 11. A call to discernment was issued in verse 11. Note the large letters with which he is writing. Then, divine insight regarding the motives, the drivers, the aspirations of the Judaizers were given to us in verses 12 and 13. You note that he says in verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh. That's the, what drives them. That's their motivation. They are not men of the word, Paul says. They are men of the world. They glory and they boast in their salesmanship. In their numbers, in their oratory skills, in their convincing words. And a practical application from verses 12 and 13 sounds something like this. You should, verse 14, never speak of human advantage. The second part of verse 14, you should always glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. And in verse 15... We are not allowed, mankind is denied all material ground from boasting. Whether you're circumcision or uncircumcision and everything in between. Obviously circumcision and uncircumcision, Paul is using as ends of the spectrum. And everything in between, none of that matters. Mankind is denied all material ground from boasting. The Lord Jesus Christ, He is the believer's praise. He is the object of His glory of the believer's glory. Religious systems cannot give eternal life. The only hope is faith in the person and the work 
of Jesus Christ. He is the one who creates a new creation. Verse 15, none of these things matter but a new creation. In these final words, beginning at verse 16, Paul pronounces a blessing, but also calls for a halting, a cessation of troubles for himself. He concludes with a grace blessing that's common in all of Paul's letters, but with two added words, brethren and amen. And we'll look at those just briefly when we get there. But first, in these final words, let's look at verse 16. Verse 16, here is the blessing of peace and mercy for those who are justified by faith. Note what Paul says. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Paul says that those who will walk, those who will follow, the word means to follow, in contrast to verse 12. In contrast to those who desire to make a good showing. You see, Paul draws a contrast there in this exact words. Verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing, those who will walk by this rule. You see, there are two different kinds of people there, two groups of people that Paul is making making us aware of. And the contrast is, once again, pride versus grace. Man's religion versus God's way because there are those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh and then there are those who will walk by this rule peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God so the contrast here is made there are two paths so often presented in scripture light and darkness Mount Ebal Mount Gerizim choose today whom you will serve one or the other you can't serve money and God All of these contrasts that we see, there is a broad road and then there is a narrow road. This contrast that's presented throughout Scripture, once again, it arrests our thoughts for we are more accustomed in these days, more accustomed in these days to evaluate life on a relative scale rather than by absolute truth. Is that not true? Yes. Oh, he's a good person. Now, if we thought biblically, we would think there is none good. There is none who does anything good. They don't seek after God. They're not a good person. What you're talking about is relative to the person who is stealing things from the store. They're good. And I understand there is a relative good. Scripture doesn't recognize that category of relative good. Please understand that. It doesn't recognize a category of relative good. You're either on... The broad road or you're on the narrow road. One of the two. One of the two. So we're more accustomed in these times to evaluate life on a relative scale rather than absolute truth. I'm thankful that people live morally when they do. The world is better when people live morally. But from a biblical definition, that's not good. Good is one who has received and who's called upon the name of the Lord, and he's good by virtue of the grace given to him. The exclusivity of Christianity is unavoidable if one desires to know the truth. They are two kinds of people. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh and those who will walk by this rule. That is, what is this rule? It is what is the fact that external is nothing, and what is internal is everything. That to be a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, makes no difference at all. It does not matter. It is not a privilege. It's not a barrier. That is verse 15. By this rule means according to this standard. And that's referring to verse 15. And those who walk by this, this, what's this? Verse 15. The principle that neither circumcision nor is anything nor uncircumcision, but only a new creation. Those who live by that principle, peace and mercy be upon them. The rule here that he says is, of course, the standard. All others are evaluated by this rule. And the word is canon. Perhaps you've seen that term. Canon is is a measuring stick. You have a yardstick that's exactly 36 inches. 
a yardstick. And so you measure things by this yardstick. Canon, Scripture is the canon of Scripture. It's the yardstick. It's the measure of truth and error, right and wrong. That's what this the word rule here, here is the word canon. And the word walk means to agree with or to be in line with. And so the blessing is conditioned upon obedience to this rule, this standard, this measure. What is the standard? The last thing, of verse 15, a new creation, that's it. It's neither a privilege, it's neither a deterrent to be circumcised or uncircumcised. What matters is the new creation. Now think back to chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9. It's a pretty famous statement. Remember the anathemas? I'm amazed that you so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. And then he pronounces an anathema in verse 8 and verse 9. You think back to that and think about what we're seeing here and you'll see another contrast that Paul makes here. Being at the very end of this letter, we need to kind of back up a little bit and think of the whole letter And not just the immediate context because he's wrapping all these things up. This conditional blessing at the end of the letter stands in marked contrast to the conditional curse that Paul opened up with in in this epistle. This conditional blessing applies a threat to those who after having read this letter do not intend to conform to the standard of faith and... Consequently, therefore, fall under the curse. So you get the idea now, the seriousness that Paul is, or another idea of how uh, Paul is writing and how serious he is. So we would read verse 11 again. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Attention, underline, double, highlight, focus here. See with, with, with which large letters that I am writing to you. So what he's doing in this blessing here at the end, he's applying a threat to those who have read the letter and if they do not intend to conform to the standard of faith, to this rule, they will fall under a curse. Two kinds of people. Those who are cursed, those who are blessed. Paul knew very well that he was writing to churches caught up in the intense conflict over a serious theological matter. And rather than smoothing over the difficulty uh, in the interest of superficial harmony at the end here, like he does, not in superficial harmony, but he does because other letters are not of this nature. But rather than do that, he did just the opposite. He emphasized the sharp differences between him and his opponents. Please understand the differences between the two gospels that you are hearing. One is really not another gospel. This other gospel you're hearing from me is the truth. And those who walk by this truth, this rule here, peace and mercy be upon them. If you walk by the other one, let him be accursed. Paul's drawing it all up, and you see he's using every bit of the parchment that he has here to drive home his point, because it is a very important point. Galatians had to make a choice. He's forcing them to make a choice. And the blessing, of course, is twofold. There is peace, and there is mercy. The peace that he's talking about here is the believer's new relationship to God. Romans 5.1 states it very well. And Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the peace. To those who recognize that circumcision or uncircumcision mean nothing, but the new creation means everything to that person the believer's new relationship to God, peace and mercy. Titus 3, 5. We would go there to see the, the example of the mercy. 
Titus 3, 5, Paul writes, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, God's kindness or His goodwill to those who are totally undeserving of that kindness. And here in Galatians specifically, the removal of our sins undeserving as we are and the setting aside of his wrath and judgment we have received mercy the objects of peace and mercy not based on what a scalpel can do but based on God's grace based on his grace God's peace and mercy are granted to those who are justified. And we, through Christ and His cross, are blessed above measure. We've said it a number of times, among all the people on earth who have ever lived, we are most blessed. There's going to be a generation of people who will be more, and we'll be with them. There's more to come. But of all the people who've lived on the earth, we are most blessed. We have so much we have access to the father read hebrews access to the father we can look up at him not bow and cower in shame we can look up because we're in christ imagine looking at the infinite god and not being struck down that's the joy the privilege that we have that we've been given in jesus christ we no longer lived We no longer live in a condemned state, no longer under his wrath. He satisfied his wrath, as the song says, as scripture says. Who are them who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them? Them are those who will walk and will follow. Same thing, walk, follow, those who adhere to the rule, those who follow the rule. So the next question is, who is the Israel of God? And the answer, Jewish believers. You ever read the term Israel in the New Testament and it denote or indicate Gentiles? No, it's not there. In the 72 times Israel, the term Israel occurs, not once does it designate Gentile or the church of Jesus Christ. So, I didn't tell you the whole truth. Israel occurs, the term Israel occurs 73 times in the New Testament. So we need a really compelling reason, really, really compelling reason, to interpret Israel here in Galatians 6.16 to be equal with the Gentiles, to be, to meet Gentile or church. We already have 72 reasons to interpret Israel as the nation or Jews. So do you need more? 72 probably takes all the space of one page. So do you want to turn the page over and find more reasons why Israel means the nation or Jews? Okay, you said yes. I heard you say yes when I was studying. So we look at the meaning of and. Uh, it says, walk by his ru- this rule and mercy, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So we look at that conjunction and. The most common use of that conjunction and in the New Testament is in its normal continuative sense. He ran and finished the race. That's a normal continuative sense. That's the most common use of and. It adds another element. And that's from the examination of the New Testament as well as the standard Greek grammars. Robertson's big grammar, all kinds of other stuff. The second most frequent use of and here is in the sense of also. They did that. and You might, you might have a sentence that begins, also they did this. Something of that, something like that. That's the second most frequent meaning of and. Is, the, is also. And a third and much less frequent use of and is translated, would be translated even. And if you have an NIV, it's translated even. 
So it would read, Peace and mercy be upon them, even upon the Israel of God. And when you say even upon the Israel of God, you're making them and the Israel of God to be equal. Now, proper hermeneutical procedure dictates that when determining the meaning of a term, the primary use of the term should be favored unless there are strong contextual reasons to go with a secondary or a more rare meaning. So, is there any reason here why we should interpret and as even? Well, let me give you a, a, theo, a brief, I mean, real short theological argument. The theological argument, or excuse me, arrangement, theological arrangement. Paul's mention of the Israel of God in Galatians takes place when? In the benediction of his letter, right? The benediction of his letter. Now, if Paul were going to make the very important theological assertion that the church is the Israel of God, we would expect that this presentation of such a degree of truth, of the level of truth that that would be, that it would take place in the main body of his letter. Perhaps maybe where he developed at length his argument for justification by faith. But he doesn't do that. So, what does the context say? Unless the context leads us otherwise, remember? We go with the most natural and normal way of translating and. So what does the context say? Well, let me ask you this. What is the entire book about? The entire book. Judaizers subverting the gospel by adding works to it. Right? And deceiving Many. Chapter 2, verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. That's the Judaizers. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. You see, the Judaizers were subverting the gospel. Their argument caught the attention of many of the Jews there, so much so that Paul said Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Now, what more fitting thing to write in a work that so strongly attacks Jewish professing believers, Jews who claim to be believers, Judaizers, than to make it most plain that he was not attacking the true believing Jews. He could say grace, he could say peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Jews who believe. Because he has criticized, criticized in a good sense, the Jewish professing believers. And here he's going to make it mo- very plain that he was not attacking the true believing Jews. The Israel, excuse me, the Israel of God and them are saved, members of the church of Jesus Christ. No, nothing different, no, not a different gospel at all. Within the church, Paul is outlining Jewish believers who have not fallen for the good showing of the Judaizers. Verse 12, remember he said, uh, they, those who desire to make a good showing, what he's saying is peace and mercy be upon those who have not caved in to the good showing. Those who have remained true to the rule. He's talking about Jewish believers who have come to understand the principles of grace. He's talking about the remnant according to the election of grace which Romans 11.5 refers to. So at So his point, his point here is this, as many as live or walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon those true Jewish believers who have not fallen prey to the Judaizers and thus have not fallen into legalism. They are the Israel of God. So them and the Israel of God they designate different, 
different peoples within the church, different ethnics within the church, ethnicities within the church is all he's saying. He's not saying there are two churches, there's two gospels, there's two peoples of God necessarily. He's not saying those things at all. He's bringing out, he's pointing out, because of the nature of the epistle, being Jews, attacking Jews, He's bringing out, in the nature of this epistle, he's bringing out the fact that there are, there are them, he brings out here them, and then there is the Israel of God. This different ethnicities within the church. That's all he's saying. Even if, I use the word even, even if this word and was to be translated even, Romans 11 still would contradict it very very clearly. So, your idea of the church and Israel and its relationship to one another does not hinge on verse 16. Though you would think that it does in some writings, it does not hinge because Romans 11 would say something very, very, it would flat out contradict this passage here. So the blessing of peace and mercy for those who are justified by faith. And Paul specially mentions the Israel of God, those Jews that are saved, because the whole epistle has been about Jews attacking Jews and the distortion of the gospel. And Paul is making it very clear right here at the very end. These people, these Jewish believers, they understand the principles of grace. Upon them be peace and mercy. That's what he's saying. From there, he goes to verse 17, the brand that Paul bore for Christ. You know he's getting close to the end of the letter because he says, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. When he says from now on, he means during the future, from this point onward. And he calls for a cessation of troubles. And it's a present command. You see that from now on, let no one, let no one accuse me or let no one cause me trouble. He's calling for this trouble from the Judaizers and all the things that are being stirred up. He's calling for a halt. This needs to cease, is what he's saying. It needs to stop. It's a present command. Paul appealed to his readers to end the controversy in Galatia that had caused him so much trouble and distracted him to such a great degree. The annoyance, the belittling of his apostolic authority, the misrepresentation of his words, all of that needs to cease, he says. It needs to end. And you see that phrase, for me. From now on, let no one cause trouble for me. Paul took the criticisms of the gospel personally. He was, after all, the gospel sent to the Gentiles. What took place in the Galatian churches affected him personally. Look at chapter 1 and verse 1. This is who he is. He is an apostle. An apostle means one who is sent. Not from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. That's who he is. In the remainder of chapter 1, he defended his commission from the Lord in bold and unqualified terms. And at this point, he adds, For I bear in my body the brand marks on my body, the brand marks of Jesus. And you note that Paul here doesn't say, I have, but I carry, I bear them. They are something that's with me all the time, is what he's saying. The I that we have here, for I bear, is the same emphasis, the same emphatic nature that you saw in verse 14. Remember in verse 14, but may it never be that I would boast. The Word of God is inspired, right? And we are to teach the Word exactly as God has given us. And so there is emphasis on that I. And so I have to let you know 
there is an emphasis. He says, may it never be that I would boast. Verse 15, for now on, let no one calls me trouble, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. There is emphasis that he puts there. It is I who carry these. The marks, the brand marks, is the word stigmata, stigmatism. They are the brands that were printed on slaves. They were burnt into them. Brands, literally, you know, brand in a cow. They were brands that were put on the slaves. They were burnt into them. And, of course, that brand indicated whose master, who owned them, who's they belong, who they belong to. So Paul says, I bore, I carry in my body or on my body the brands of Christ, my master. And that's what he means by of Jesus, that last phrase there. I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. He is my master, and I have brand marks to prove that he is my master. That's Paul's emphasis. That's what he's saying here. Physical scars as proof of his call to the apostleship. Permanent marks. These are physical scars on my body. If you look back in chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, just a couple of pages, probably three pages back, chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians in verse 4. Note that he says, In everything... Commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance and afflictions and hardships and distresses and beatings and imprisonments and tumults and labors and sleeplessness and hunger and purity and knowledge and patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and genuine love. And he goes on in verse 7. You get the idea. Here's all of these things listed. And then turn over a couple of pages to chapter 11 and begin at verse 23. At verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I'm more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times shipwreck, a night and a day I've spent in the deep. And he goes on to list different dangers. Five times he received 39 lashes and three times beaten with rods. So when Paul says, from now on, from this point on, I've laid this truth out, this gospel of the grace, of God's grace out. So from this point on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear the brand marks on my body. The Judaizers, what's their mark? A mark made by a scalpel. I have the brand marks. The brand marks of Jesus Christ. He says, that is my master. Permanent marks physical scars on his body. It showed that he belonged to Jesus as his slave. He is my master. I am his slave. Now Paul may be implying a contrast here. The scars he had received as the target of persecution in contrast to circumcision as we've alluded to a couple of times. They were proof of his devotion to Christ. The Judaizers insisted on circumcision that they might avoid persecution. Yes? They might avoid persecution. They're not willing to suffer for Christ. Their pride is greater. The marks Paul carried were undeniable evidence that no one could mistake his owner, his master. So the call, therefore, this call, verse 15, is not from now on let no one trouble me for I have, I have enough to bear. It is this, from now on, let no one impugn or doubt my authority. The brand marks of Jesus which I carry are the seal of my apostleship. 
the visible vouchers of my devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. So from now on, stop. This should not be. That's the brand that Paul bore for Christ. So we have the blessing of peace and mercy for those who are justified by faith. And then the call, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of who I belong to, of Jesus Christ our Lord. And then comes the benediction. The benediction of the letter to the churches of Galatia. The grace of our Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Grace throughout this letter to the Galatian churches is set against law. Law, grace. Both with regard to our standing, both with regard to a standing before God, that is a standing that's counted righteous, and living a life that pleases God, free from the law. You are saved by grace, you live by grace, in other words. You're not, as Paul says, you having begun, he says in chapter 3, look, you, you began so well, where, why did you jump ship? You, you jump tracks here. So it's by grace that we're saved, it's by grace that we live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Grace, that term is used seven times in Galatians, and it reminds us again here at the very end that salvation in the sense of the entire work of God in our life, or justification in particular, is by grace alone and the only person qualified to satisfy the Father's wrath, that is Jesus Christ alone. There is no other. There is no other hope. Now hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. There is no other hope. Your spirit, what He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, you, means you. Now, Paul was not excluding the physical body here, just as in other benedictions and other of his letters, he does not mention the Spirit. He's not intended to exclude the Spirit in those benedictions. But here, he does put the spotlight on the need for spiritual dis- uh, stamina and discernment. May the Lord be with your spirit. You're, you need strength. You need discernment. You need stamina. May the Lord strengthen you. He says that very same, uh, very some, something very similar in 2 Timothy 4.22. And the effect is... Paul is saying, may God strengthen you, Timothy, to carry out and finish the call that you have been given. Don't be timid. I'm praying that you will be strengthened in your spirit. Not necessarily neglecting the flesh, the body, but the emphasis, the spotlight is on the spirit as it is here. These Galatian churches, these people here, need spiritual stamina and discernment. And the last word is brethren. It's unique. And it highlights his affection for them. And you know, this has been a pretty tough gospel, a pretty tough message here. Pretty tough. I mean, when you look at chapter 3, you foolish Galatians, that's not, he's not kidding around. You foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? Who has bewitched you? So this has been a, this has been a tough letter, which helps us to understand why he's mentioned in verse 16, the Israel of God at the end. And why he uses the term brethren. It's unique. It highlights his affection for them. After all his sorrow, after all his amazement that he's recorded here about them, the censure, the sadness, he parts with them in kindness. Brethren. Term of endearment. After all the pain they had cost him, yet they were dear to him. He cared for them. And then we have the very last word, amen, or amen. Amen means, so let it be. So let it be. What we have, and it, of course it refers to what, we, what Paul has just spoken. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. So let it be. Amen. So let it be.
In other contexts, it means truly, truly. In the Gospel of John, truly, truly, I say to you, amen, amen. It's truly. Here in this right here, it's so let it be. So let it be. All these things, all these things that I've just mentioned to you, may Christ be with your spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last words, leaving Galatians here and reading a passage from 2 Timothy 4. The last words recorded in Scripture by Paul demonstrate the great confidence that he had in his God. Now, recall 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received 39 lashes. Shipwrecked. Beaten three times with rod, by rods. Rejected by my countrymen. Perhaps rejected by my own family. Even some who claim to follow Christ and assist me have abandoned me. The he'll list in 2 Timothy. But his last words recorded in Scripture here that speak of, uh, now after this he says, greet, greet these people and bring my coat to me, things like this. But this is his last statement here. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever, so let it be. Amen? So let it be. He will rescue me. And that rescue may not be deliverance out of that situation. The rescue may be, I'm bringing you home. You don't have to suffer anymore. And he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let it be. So in these last closing remarks, we have the blessing of peace and mercy for those who are justified by faith. We have the brand, the brand marks that Paul bore on his body for Christ. And finally, the benediction, pronouncing or or praying or wishing, desiring that grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with them, which strengthen them spiritually. So let it be. May God grant us, grant us to be more like Christ because we have spent 56 Sundays going through this this epistle to the Galatians. May God be pleased to cause us to be more discerning, more discerning Because like these Galatian believers, there are things swirling around in our world. And we could say, God, may your grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, be with us. So let it be. Grant us spiritual stamina and discernment. Please find us faithful when you return. When you come, please find us faithful. Our Father, thank you for this epistle. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. As Paul expressed that you will rescue him and you will bring him safely. We can say the same thing with all the confidence. that You are a God who will rescue and who will bring us safely. We look forward to being home. We look forward to enjoying all the blessings of our heavenly citizenship. Father, till that time comes, we ask that you would strengthen us. We ask that you would be pleased to glorify yourself in us, through us. May the church of Jesus Christ, not only here but the world over, truly glorify you in all that it does. These things we ask in our Savior's name, so let it be.